ಎಂ ಶೈವಾಸಮುಪಾಸತೆ ಶಿವ ಇದಿ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮೇತಿ ವೇದ ಅಂದಿನೋ ಬೌದ್ಧ ಬುದ್ಧ ಇದಿ ಪ್ರಮಾಣ ಬಡವ ಕರ್ತೇತಿ ನಯ್ಯಾಯಿಗ ಅರ್ಹನ್ ನಿತ್ಯಥ ಜೈನ ಶಾಸನರದ ಕರ್ಮೇತಿ ಮೀಮಾಂಸಗ ಸೋಯಂ ವೋ ವಿದಧಾದು ವಾಂಛಿತ ಫಲಂ ತ್ರೈಲೋಕ್ಯನಾಥೋ ಹರಿ ಸೋಯಂ ವೋ ವಿದಧಾದು ವಾಂಛಿತ ಫಲಂ ತ್ರೈಲೋಕ್ಯನಾಥೋ ಹರಿ ಮದೀಯ ಹೃದಯಾಕಾಶೆ ಸದಾನಂದಮಯೋ ಗುರು ಉದೇತು ಸತತ ಸಮ್ಯಕ್ ಅಜ್ಞಾನತಿ ಮಿರಾರುಣ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಹರಿ ನಾವು ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಸ್ ಶ್ಯಾಲ್ ಟುಗೆದರ್ ಚ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ತ್ರೀ ಟೈಮ್ಸ್ ದ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಆಸ್ಪೀಷಿಯಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪ್ಯೂರಿಫಿಕೇಟರಿ ಮೋನೋಸಿಲಬಲ್ our idea in doing this collective recitation will be not merely to be benefited ourselves but to generate a global influence a spiritual influence which will be benefiting in various ways the whole of life upon the globe this kind of a permeation this kind of a measure and magnitude can be conceived and imparted only by the human mind make use of this capacity of the mind and have the feeling that the chanting must permeate in the whole globe generating its salutary sublime influence <clears throat> interlock your fingers and put them on your lap sit comfortably erect close your eyes open the mouth and the heart alike and join me oh i don't think all of you participated why this shyness and reservation join me at least for the sake of your family members the descendants and the entire world oh not sufficient happy to be in the midst of all of you especially in this hall for a spell of 3 days like this today we have already had a good extent of time utilized for other purposes we were also held up by traffic on the road but tomorrow we will sharply start it at 7:45 day after tomorrow also and i would like all of you to be present here quite in time a little before if you want me to arrive i shall also arrive now three days our discussion will be on the goal of life and particularly on the basis of bhagavad gita which is a text and a scriptural composition all of you are already familiar with in malaysia i would have spoken about gita every year for a number of years the first time i visited malaysia was in 1973 and for a short break in between i have been almost visiting this country every year so you can imagine how many times i would have spoken about bhagavad gita from various angles from various visions 
from different points of view etc this bhagavad gita is a text which can never be exhausted either in the matter of reading or understanding much less in dissemination and not only that wherever we go a substantial part of the audience would be interested to listen to bhagavad gita they are geared for it it is one handbook which every hindu particularly can keep in hand and make use of if there is any problem in human life a challenge a persuasion a demand a warrant or a crisis you will find an answer in bhagavad gita so the importance of bhagavad gita is being known more and more in the world and a number of languages have translated the scripture into their own and any translation into any language will make that scripture supreme in that part that is the quality of bhagavad gita there was a reference to bhagavad gita as something like an administrative gospel i formed this phrase to describe bhagavad gita with a view to bring bhagavad gita's message to greater and broader light these are days of management and administration and there is a lot of research going into these two subjects in the different parts of the world but whether they have really done justice to the very subject of management and administration is a matter of doubt we sometimes sometimes take a workshop our workshop particularly titled experiential vedanta we have conducted this workshop for one or two days in several parts in india one management person who is now an executive director in the times organization in bangalore he and his wife attended this workshop and after that he wrote a letter to us i think we had passed the letter here and unnikrishnan and party would have circulated it and it's a letter worth going into he says that i have been a management man and i have been going into this subject various kinds of exposure in the form of training workshop etc are going on the entire world has spent billions of dollars on researching into this subject and a lot of money has been spent and also gained but nowhere i have found an entry into the subject as i could get in the two days of the workshop that you had conducted these workshops have never been able to go into even the bring of the subject do you know why for the simple reason that everything in human life is an extension and expression of man's inner personality and this inner personality consists of only two components or factors on the one hand it is the mind and on the other it is the intelligence your life is an expression of your mind an extension of your mind all our discoveries all our inventions all the science and technology advancement that we have been able to achieve anywhere in any part of the world at any time is nothing but an expression and extension of the powerful intelligence that we have and the inspirational mind that we hold if i speak the speech becomes audible through the mouth but the ideas are not generated either in the tongue or in the throat the vocal system is only answering or following some ideational and knowledge process that go on in the brain and mystically it is being conveyed to the vocal system you cannot lift your hand without the knowledge and the motivation of the mind every act is done designed first in the mind initiated by the mind implemented by the mind it is also terminated and concluded by the mind this mind when properly done when properly dealt with the whole management and administration will also be proper a mind that is organized will be able to do any kind of an organization in the best and the most effective manner this is a point that people are not able to understand everything proceeds from within you from within you the whole universe is sourced by your mind is sourced by the intelligence this bhagavad gita is such a beautiful scripture 
i would like to tell say something about bhagavad gita especially relating to what is the thought process which bhagavad gita represents and what are the original scriptures or sources of information and knowledge that we have would you like to hear bhagavad gita is a dialogue which transpired in the kurukshetra battlefield between arjuna and krishna arjuna was the fighter who had come to fight the war krishna was his charioteer arjuna was very proud when he had krishna as the charioteer it was an ambition of his life an aspiration he had and it was fulfilled when krishna consented to becoming his charioteer for the entire mahabharata war which lasted for 18 days this dialogue that transpired in the battlefield for about 2 and 1/2 or 3 hours was heard by sanjaya who was interested by vyasadeva to narrate the whole proceedings of the war to the blind dhritarashtra the king of hastinapura are you able to follow me is it interesting it was heard by sanjaya and the whole conversation along with the events of the war they were all recorded by vyasadeva in the form of a written document this transpired 5154 years ago 5154 years ago this was transcribed so to say rendered into into paper into palm leaves in those days by vyasadeva so vyasadeva presents before us this conversation we have got some cultural texts of the cultural texts the vedas are the most ageless we cannot say when the vedas were evolved it is the fundamental source of information for us they are called vedas the word veda itself means knowledge and the source of knowledge these vedas were composed and evolved in the prehistoric times so we cannot say when they were evolved then in the way of written information or document we have ramayana written by valmiki in treta yuga which is very 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 far back then the closest to us is mahabharata this is now kali yuga the mahabharata war took place at the end of dwapara yuga and after the war vedavyasa must have completed the writing in which all the details about mahabharata war were also included that is why i say it was written 5154 years ago this calculation is completely borne out by various documents that have been researched into and found and evaluated i am not going to into details bhagavad gita occurs in the shanti parva of mahabharatam which itself consists of 18 parvas 18 sections and this is in the shanti parva because of the exclusive and majestic complete character of bhagavad gita this gita was separated from the text so to say and people started reading commenting upon explaining the mahabharata war was a record or a documentation of many events that took place that's all it is mostly history but when bhagavad gita we read though it is historically a conversation that took place so many years back the substance the content the message the value all incorporated in the text have got an eternal relevance relevance to any human being either as an individual or as a family or a social segment or a national group or a global community it's always having a bearing finding that it is so it was separately taken and it was given a very special place because of its exclusive character what is the special place that bhagavad gita has first of all it is it's a historic document and it is part of mahabharatam composed by vasudeva vedas were only uttered uttered and heard and learned during the time of the vedas there was no writing at all to chant the vedas with all the etymological details pronunciational details it is not so easy so a teacher had to chant it for you and the student has to hear it directly then he has to chant it himself several times being corrected by the teacher so it was always uttered and heard heard and learned 
learned and perfected perfected and pursued thereafter bequeathed to the others this is the way the vedas were taught unlike the vedas when it comes to mahabharatam and bhagavad gita it is a written document it is one of the three cultural texts called prasthana trayam the word prasthana has got profound meaning i am not going into it now it is called the mighty and the great journey that we undertake human life is a journey upon this earth undertaken by every individual we start the journey at the time of birth for the first few years we don't know thereafter we start learning knowledge we are told that this is our your mother this is your father etc etc finally as we start growing in knowledge in our own choices ambitions aspirations goals etc the journey becomes more and more serious more and more profound and you can take it to anywhere you like but what should be the goal of life after all all of us are born as human beings we live upon the earth as members of the family members of the society citizens of the globe so there must be something called a common goal of human life so this prasthana traya deals with it on the one hand it is the vedic upanishads the upanishads are the end portion of the vedas there this goal is discussed in a very good manner very authoritative inspiring and persuasive manner so the prasthana trayam consists of the vedic upanishads on the one hand and thereafter we have something called brahma sutras the brahma sutras are a logical an absolutely rational rendering of whatever the upanishadic statements are in the upanishads they are lying in a scattered manner disconnected manner so brahma sutras have strung all of them like pearls being strung into a necklace in the brahma sutras you will find it is all absolutely rational and they are all aphorisms or aphoristic statements formulae consisting of a few words it is not poetry it is not even a sentence always so just in the form of a formulae now bhagavad gita itself being part of mahabharatam it discusses the same subject which the upanishads have discussed which the brahma sutras have strung together but it is a commentary but bhagavad gita being illustrated with reference to the instance of mahabharata var it becomes unlike brahma sutras and unlike the vedic upanishads am i clear am i clear or shall i explain it further we don't know when the upanishads were formed who formed them at what time it must have been composed at different times in different places by different people so there is no historic reference in it there are some instances containing them that's all so in brahma sutras it is all logical and rational it was written by vyasadeva but when it comes to bhagavad gita it is very clearly illustrated it took place in kurukshetra battlefield it was during the mahabharata war before it commenced and it was a dialogue between arjuna and krishna it was heard by sanjaya vedavyasa rendered it to paper all these historic details are there but in brahma sutras it is not so upanishads we don't know also the upanishads are more even full and inspiring than historical the upanishads are valid for the message they convey the inspiration and enlightenment and the persuasion they provide they have an ageless past as i said they have a special sanctity and sacrosanctness they are called divya they are not just human they are very divine the vedic thinkers thinkers first of all were led by facts and compulsions around them are you with me when i say this they started thinking their thinking was guided by facts and compulsions around them and because of the facts and compulsions they started thinking there was no deeper inquiry persuasions it is something like this there is a temple nearby so many devotees come to the temple they worship stand in front of muruga some rituals and ceremonies are performed they submit their prayers and go if you ask any one of them what is this temple institution what is an idol 
why is it that we are praying what are these ceremonies what are they meaning if you ask any details they will not be able to understand or say but this temple itself is a great institution which shaped in the mind of relevant thinkers of devotion there are many practices we indulge in or we follow we don't know what this practice is so thinking is one doing is another so our vedic thinkers started first of all surrounded by certain facts and compulsions and all that they could understand was sitting upon the earth or living upon the earth they were surrounded by a huge and endless sky it was the sun on the one hand moon on the other a number of stars countless innumerable hovering in the sky so they found that it was something very immense profound and infinite whenever they found something like that man himself felt very humble and he started he started bursting into prayers and hymns when you see something great and glorious before you what do you do you fold your hand bend your head and started praising that is what our vedic thinkers first of all did suddenly there was thunder there was lightning cyclone wind fire turbulence of weather floods drought so many adversities were facing them they did not know who were controlling them who were instrumenting them not knowing all these things they started praying praying lifting their hands looking into the sky they started praying praying uttering hymns this is how they started that is why i told you there was no deep thinking there there was no inquiry they were not satisfied we are all praying and praying and praising so they said we must offer something to whomever we are praying to so they evolved the fire sacrifices prepared special formations of havan kunda altars and started depositing various materials to ignite fire when the fire was blazing forth they uttered mantras and offering many things primarily ghee which fire would be happy to receive then boiled rice and so many other materials all of them were received by fire and reduced to ashes so they were happy otherwise these deities them whom they were praising and praying to they would not come down and receive whatever they offered suppose they had offered a cup of tea do you think any deity would come down and receive it just like a friend receives so they would not have the satisfaction so they started doing these fire sacrifices it went on for some time they were not happy so they stopped it after some time you will not be able to do these protracted ceremonies also so they stopped what did they do they receded from all that closed their eyes and started delving into their mind this meant something very great serious and substantial are you following me ninga puriyadha ungalku it meant a great difference enquiry started introspection started serious deliberations took place what are we doing why are we doing whom are we addressing to when are we going to get a response is it all a unilateral exercise or is it something different in this way doubts questions enquiries investigations all those things started that meant a transition from the external to the internal and from the mind to the intelligence this transition is what you find in the upanishads in the upanishads you will find it is all very very clear as i told you the upanishads were not written they were only uttered heard and learned by listening listening they remained articulational for a very very long time before the vedas used to be written as they are available to us now <clears throat> i would like to say the upanishads are multi centered they are multi sourced and multi pronged but all of them have one concentric approach they have a concentric approach and they have an ultimate goal and an objective shall i tell you one or two of them would you like to hear ha huh? i would like to take you to the famous mundaka upanishad mundaka upanishad belongs belongs to atharva veda 
there we find a householder like you not like me and ma a householder like you a very elderly man he goes to angiras a sage an ascetic person living in his hermitage in a forest and you know what he did angud ashaunaga presents before him a question what huh? what was all along being done uttering praises and hymns performing rituals and ceremonies this householder shaunaga who was performing all these for decades and decades at one point of time he felt that what is it that i am doing i am doing i am doing i am doing okay to whom is it meant to somebody does he receive what i give is he happy about it so it's all my doing and my assumption then why am i calling somebody to receive it so there seems to be a gap it is a unilateral exercise it cannot answer my question so i want to know something different what is the purpose of all these things when am i going to end or get a satisfaction that whatever i offer has been received by whomever it is meant for we generally say indraya idam namama what i offer is meant for indra not for me where is this indra does he come and receive it has he got what i have given who will answer this question you tell me so shaunaka felt a sense of loss something missing in his life decades and decades he has been performing this vedic and ritualistic life the mind is not satisfied so he was he was gripped by a sense of inquiry nobody is able to answer him all are traveling in the same boat so he decided to go to angiras a saint living in a hermitage in a forest he goes prostrates before him and he asks a very very important question what is that question kasmin nu bhagavo vijnate sarvam idam vijnatam bhavati iti within the human body we have an inner personality what is that personality consisting of i always explain it mind intelligence and ego ego you can keep quiet for the same time being we have got a mind that feels very sentimental and emotional it is an intelligence which calls for reason compulsion even the other day somebody came to our center where we are living and he said these are days when we ask children to do something they ask why are we doing why should we do our children are more intelligent than perhaps ourselves their lessons are far advanced in life the ancient graduate lessons are being taught perhaps in schools now so they are very intelligent so if you ask them to do something it is very proper that they ask what is the meaning of this action what shall i do what is the purpose if you say be truthful they ask why are we truthful to be to be truthful what is the harm if we speak untruth if we can win our objective and you have to give an answer to them so interrogation questioning inquiry investigation searching seeking this is the very quest of human intelligence to be happy and contented is the compulsion of the human mind it is a sentimental and emotional unnegotable need that we have so far as the mind is concerned so shaunaka found the whole life meaningless so he goes to angiras he is leading a different type of life not a householder so let me go to him householders cannot give us an answer so let us do to go to some other holder so he said ashram holder let him let us approach him and he goes and asks him kasmin nu bhagavo vijnate sarvam idam vijnatam bhavati di is there anything by knowing which i can know the entirety of existence velangaradha ungalku is there anything by is there anything by knowing which i can know the entirety of existence he says what a great enquiry is this i have a quest in my life what is that i want to know everything after all this earth is only a planet or a solid matter it is surrounded by 
thin air and the air is surrounded further by space and all the planets and celestial bodies are within the space space has no mass no weight but within the space so many massive things are there can from nothing these many things come there seems to be a mystery what is the source of all this magic how do i get at it so the intelligence cannot stop it becomes sleepless if a question arises and the answer is not had so he became sleepless and goes to angiras and then he asks kasmin bhagavo vidyate sarvam idam vidyatam bhavati di this is the beginning of bunda gopanishad you tell me now where from did veda start from praises and prayers to unseen and unknown superhuman powers followed by so many rituals and ceremonies fire sacrifices withdrawal from them now taking up an enquiry so in the upanishad the subject is we are they are the upanishadic author tells us that here is a householder called shaunaka very mature well aged and he finds that his household life of vedic indulgences has not been of any practical benefit it leaves the mind discontented it leaves the mind unsatisfied the enquiry and the seeking become strong and he is left lordless so he goes there and submits this question angiras felt very happy a very good disciple a very good seeker i have got so he starts giving him an answer he says you are asking about knowledge what is that knowledge by virtue of which i can know everything in life everything in existence so this is a question pertaining to knowledge my dear son listen to me knowledge is divided into two sectors one sector is called the inferior knowledge apara vidya and the other sector is called para vidya so knowledge itself is divided into two one is called the lower the inferior another is called the superior the higher within the lower knowledge everything that you learn comes including four vedas and six shastras by the word shastra we mean different subjects scientific subjects so all the subjects that are being taught in schools academic centers they come within the inferior knowledge then what is superior knowledge superior knowledge is that paratu yaya tad aksharam adhigamyade are you with me ha huh? paratu yaya that is called the superior knowledge by virtue of which tad aksharam adhigamyade you are able to know the imperishable source of the world superior knowledge is that knowledge which will lead to knowing the very source of existence the very source of the visible universe he describes it further i am not going into details how do you get at it it is something that you cannot see or hear you have to contemplate upon it. how will you contemplate upon it by virtue of the qualities and characteristics it has it is the one thing that is eternal in this world nityam vibhum sarvagatam all pervading susukshmam extremely subtle in nature yad bhuta yonim paripashyanti dhira the wise people say that this is the source of the entire creation so the superior knowledge is that knowledge which will take you to the citadel of the very source of creation what do you think of it this is what upanishad is i am not going into detail we are living in a universe in a world of matter and energy earth is matter water is matter air is matter fire is energy space is neither so we are living in a world of visible matter and energy the matter energy universe where from has it sprung or where from has it originated if you ask the upanishads say very clearly this is its source 
so what do you think of india indians and the hindus you tell me what do you think of your ancestors were they foolish people ha ah muttalangal irunnala what are you saying the ascetic living in a hermitage in a forest is discussing a subject called the very source of the universe which the modern scientists are yet to arrive at they did not have a telescope they did not have a microscope they did not have anything their laboratory was their own body their instruments were their own mind and intelligence nothing else they looked at the same world which the modern scientists also deal with and by a process of inquiry a rational search and research they were able to unearth the very source of the universe this is how upanishads discuss the subject as i told you there were so many upanishadi gods they were belonging to different places different times in different ways they spoke about the subject one way there is another way what is that kathopanishad in the kathopanishad what is the subject discussed it is death 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 when a person is said to be dying is there anything surviving death or everything is over at death does death mark extinction or death is only bodily and biological and something different from the body survives this is the question in the katha upanishad we are presented a very beautiful instance that is why i said the upanishads are presenting some instances it doesn't tell you when it took place etc this happened that's all vajashravas decided to perform a sacrifice he made all arrangements to perform the yaga elaborate arrangements a yaga requires a lot of expenditure arrangement organization and the like something very holy when a yaga is properly performed the performer will be left with nothing everything will be given off used that is how a yaga is is called sacrifice sacrifice whatever you have in the holy process of performing a sacrifice or a yaga the most important occasion in performing a yaga is giving away gifts dana for giving dana the best of material should be selected and it should be given in a very humble loving zealous manner it should be given with the chanting of mantras veda mantras what did vajashravas do he selected useless materials from the palace and wanted to give them with holy vedas chanting the mantras see the contradiction najigeda sees son looking at it felt very bad what is it that my father is doing this is a noble and a great sacrifice and very good article should be given he has selected useless cows from the cowshed cows which have three teats one horn lactation is about to be over some cows which have no teeth to chew even hay grass such things she has, he has selected and what is he going to do he is going to gift them to brahmanas chanting holy veda mantras so he felt so disappointed being a son he did not want to say anything aggressively to the father so he creeped in and said my dear father whom are you going to give me to the father got excited and angry he said i give you to the god of death he said what does it mean better go and die this is the meaning the sacrifice is very holy and in the holy sacrifice when the most moving and noble time occasion came he is doing just the opposite now you tell me whether a performance will purify a man or introspection will purify a man i want an answer from you right here will mere performance purify a man or good and noble introspection purify a man after all you have to purity is for the mind the mind will not be touched by a food by an article by so many different things as you see spare on the body the mind is non material supra material 
If the mind has to be purified, it can be purified only by pure and noble thoughts. Now here, in the name of sacrifice, the father is doing something very ignoble, unholy, demeaning and degenerating in character. So the son who was never performing it, he only looked at it and thought about it. He had a touch of feeling and he goes to the father wanting to administer a note of correction. But he could not do it because the father got angry. He could have asked, my dear son, why are you asking? I don't understand the meaning. Am I doing anything wrong? Do you have anything specially to say? Then if a discussion had taken place, he would have told, this is what I feel. Immediately you could have removed all the other cows, etc., brought the better ones and given them properly. The matter ends there. But the father got so angry, he said, he sent him to Yama. He went to Yama. And Yama was not available. He had gone for a mass slaughter. He came back only after three days. Seeing the Brahmacharin, the celibate from the earth, he got so afraid. A Brahmacharin from the earth has come and he has been starving at my door for three days, unhosted by anybody, uncared by anybody. What kind of a sin I have incurred now? What shall I do? So he called for water, washed his feet, gave him some drink and finally he said, for the three days you have been starving, all that I can do is, I will give you three magnificent boons. Ask for them. See how the Upanishads teach us. The Upanishads are depicting before you only an instance. It is not historical instance. It is an instance that transpired. They are not giving you the time in which it takes place, place, etc., etc. Vajasravas performed a sacrifice. Najiketas, the son, interacted with the father, as a result of which the father sent him to God of death and he starved there. This is the occasion. These are all the settings of the Upanishads. When three boons were offered, the first boon this noble boy asked for was, I have come from the earth and I am come to the abode of death. So when I go back, my father should recognize me. Can you imagine? Suppose a dead person comes back to your house. Will you be able to identify him? A white man may become black. A human may appear to be a ghost. After death, if somebody appears, we cannot say what kind of a figure he will be. So when I go back, my father should recognize me. And he must welcome me warmly. There must be good relationship, trust, harmony, fondness, etc. This is the first boon that I want. The first boon for anybody in a human life is, you must have a good family. There must be family well-being, peace and harmony there. We may have money or no money, rich or poor. Let us have a good place to live, where the members of the family are clasping each other with fondness, trusting, everybody is helping to the other, there is no distrust anywhere. This is the minimum atmosphere we want. Just see the Upanishads, how they teach you. He said, okay. The next boon was, please tell me that ritual by performing which I will get the highest of heaven. Yama conveyed, detailed before him, the performance of such a ritual. He said, have you learned? Have you understood? Yes. Repeat it. So he repeated. He was very happy. So I will name this ritual after you. So there is a sacrifice called Najiketa Yajna. Even now we have it. Now he was ready for the third boon. Yama said, ask for the third boon. When the third boon came, he said, Yeyam prede vijigitsa manushye asti ityye ge nayam asti dijayge edad vidyam anushishtas tvayaham varanam esha varastradiyaha The third boon, the subject of the Upanishad is that, that he says, Yeyam prede vijigitsa manushye When human beings die in this world, there is always a doubt lingering. This doubt started right from the time the first man died. It is still there. Asti tyege nayam asti jayge. Some people say that only the biological body has become functionless. 
the presence that was there animating the body activating the body call it the soul call it the jiva call it the spirit that is still there is the view of a few people others say nonsense it's all biological when the biological body ceases to breathe it's all gone you burn it off that's all nothing more is to be thought but there is a doubt all people do not agree so you being the god of death i want you to tell me very clearly whether people die upon the earth and if they survive are you bringing them which is the storehouse you are keeping in open the doors of the storehouse and show them to me or say that there is no death what is the truth i want to know this instruct me yama was surprised he was taken aghast he said what so many people have died and so many people i have brought nobody questions like this here is an undying boy and he has come and he is asking me this question what shall i do now so he was very much surprised very much surprised more than surprised he was afraid even yama was afraid before an inquiry made by najigedas so you tell me what is the most costly proposition in human life a quest for knowledge we have got senses we have got mind we have got intelligence the senses are inferior to the mind the mind is inferior to the intelligence the intelligence is superior so when the intelligence is requisition and it extra, it starts expressing itself this will shake the whole world i very vociferously say the world is always ruled by two factors one is money another is intelligence intelligence can make money money cannot necessarily make intelligence the world is ruled by intelligence and money we want the world to be ruled by intelligence and not by money this is the truth any time in this world moneyed people can do many things in this world but it is superior it is not superior it is inferior to intelligence so when intelligence came when najigedas came up with an intelligent question yama started shuddering shuddering everyone is haunted by death death is a haunting concern for us we must find an answer about this question why are we afraid of death all people are dying we will also die then what is the point in fearing it so are we able to think fearlessly about death we are not able to so kathopanishad discusses the very subject of death in a graphic setting like this with a lot of pragmatism with a lot of realism how they discuss the subject <clears throat> then yama starts saying my dear najigedas don't ask me this one question i will give you many other things as a reward as a gift i will give you any area of earth that you want i will gift you a number of damsels some people will sing some people will dance some people will play their musical instruments all of them will delight you ceaselessly and whatever area you look at and you can mark i will make you the single monarch of the place never ask me for the mystery about death najigeda said no 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 whatever you propose to give me are shobhava martyasya yadanta kaidad sarve indriyanam jarayanti teja abhi sarvam jeevitam alpameva tavai bavaha astava nritya geede whatever you say you offer to live in a single family with one husband or one wife or two or three children itself is huge problem now you are telling me that so many things i will give you but i have to only two eyes to enjoy and what is this enjoyment whenever the senses are experiencing or enjoying anything whatsoever sarvendriyanam jarayanti tejaha this is the teaching and declaration evaluation of the upanishad every time something is enjoyed in that enjoyment process the senses their power of enjoyment is corroded corroded so all enjoyments have a corrosive effect of the sen- on the senses do you agree or not 
by seeing are the eyes becoming healthier and stronger or weaker huh? why are you keeping quiet <laughs> see by any kind of an enjoyment we are aging if you see more the corrosive effect will be more you cannot tolerate all kinds of sight all kinds of brilliance you cannot hear all kinds of sound we speak about ultra sound and all that supersonic sound ultraviolet ray and many things we are speaking about so everything is corrosive to the senses najigeda says and nothing we are not sure about for the morrow all are perishable all are transitory so the world is transitory my body is transitory enjoyment makes it all the more transitory so i don't want any one of them let all of them be in your own safe custody he said the horses you keep the damsels you keep the musical instruments you keep everything you have with yourself najigedas does not want any one of them i am only interested in listening to the answer to my question tell me then he says even gods of heavens are doubtful about it he said that is all the more reason why i should know it from you finally he compliments him and discloses discloses him this is called the kathopanishad version i am giving you two versions now when it comes to bhagavad gita which is our subject that bhagavad gita is a very classically written document it is not like the upanishads the vedic upanishads which were only uttered and heard it was very clearly written bhagavad gita belongs to mahabharatam which itself consists of 125000 sanskrit verses and bhagavad gita consists of 700 verses so you can understand the difference vyasa deva compiled the vedas and he is the author of mahabharatam also the war field dialogue the kurukshetra battlefield dialogue maha bhagavad gita was rendered by vedavyasa as part of his mahabharata narration in a very copious manner arjuna came to the battlefield of kurukshetra after 13 years of preparation krishna was the charioteer as i said he raised his gandiva famous gandiva and said krishna take my chariot up front station it in a suitable on a suitable point so that i can survey the army and decide upon my fighting strategy he said krishna drove the chariot stationed it in front of bhishma and drona and said look at them as much as you want tell me whether you are prepared to fight or not krishna is always very clever over clever so he stationed the chariot right in front of bhishma the grandfather and drona the teacher these are the commanders in chief you have to fight them first pierce their bodies kill them if necessary then only you can go inside the army see whether you are fit you are ready arjuna looked at them and suddenly crumbled crumbled what is meant by crumbling arjuna was belonging to the kshatriya clan so he had a lot of physical strength and prowess he had gandiva the greatest of acquisition that you can think of it is just like an industrial is having the whole of world as his empire his gandiva was so powerful nobody could face him with the gandiva then he had a strong body a strong mind he could do penance and austerity without sleeping for many months if necessary then he had a sharp intelligence he could understand he had learned the scriptures so the material acquisition the physical strength the mental strength the intellectual acumen all these things together crumbled by looking at bhishma and drona he said my body is trembling my mouth is dry there is horripilation in the whole body the intelligence is baffled gandiva slips from my hand unable to stand he sat in the chariot tell me who is this arjuna in the case of angiras it was shavunaga who came there as an enquirer in the case of yamadharma raja it was najigedas who went there after death 
this we are not going to be but arjuna is a model middle aged man he was given to the best of secular activity administration administration ruling of the kingdom handling the welfare of the subjects of of his kingdom now such a man given to the superb task of administration including dealing with people killing the enemies if necessary that man at the middle age of his life he resembles all of us we want to live in this world we want to tackle the subject called life handle it whatever hazards are there challenges are there provocations are there intimidations are there confrontations are there all of them we will have to meet we will have to meet and go ahead in our life now this arjuna completely resembles us he came and he was unable to then he started arguing presenting his grievance saying that i will not fight i will retreat i will not fight krishna spoke to him a few words it was a kind of admonition exhortation it is too late arjuna that you say something like this 13 years have passed this war has been contemplated for decades and decades in your life after everything is done i myself blew my conch prepare to take up the challenge which bhishma in bhishma initiated now you cannot say i can retreat this is unbecoming when krishna said it it threw him into an introspection the crying arjuna stopped his tears and he started making a few enquiries and the first enquiry i will explain it tomorrow kaapanya dosho bhagata swabhava pruchami tvam dharma sammudha cheta यश्रेयस्यान्निश्चिदं ब्रूहितन्मे शिष्यस्तेहं शाधिमां त्वां प्रपन्नम् आई हैव हर्ड व्हाट यू हैव सेड कृष्णा इट पुट्स मी टू अ मूड ऑफ इंट्रोस्पेक्शन एंड द फर्स्ट ऑब्जर्वेशंस दैट आई गेट माय सेल्फ आर कार्पण्य दोषो बहद स्वभावः माय नेचर हैज बीन ओवरपावर्ड बाय नैरो माइंडेडनेस i am not able to think of the war think of the consequences think of even life chatriya life as a whole some kind of constriction occupies my mind overpowers my mind i am not able to think properly it is a defect it is an evil it is a vice it's a shortcoming in my personality i agree therefore i ask you in a mood of delusion what shall i do our subject is goal of life this is what arjuna says yachrayasya nishchitam bruhi tanme tell me very clearly where in lies everlasting goodness and promotion for me by which shall i attain everlasting goodness shreya that one word two letter word what is meant by shreya in good english we have prosperity means economic financial welfare etc the other is called inner felicity f e l i c i t y look into the dictionary if you don't know the meaning and find it out one is called the material welfare and prosperity another is called inner peace and beatitude yet shreyasya nischitam bruhitan me by what process shall i attain everlasting goodness and welfare for me instruct me that very clearly i am no more the fighter i am no more your brother in law i am a seeking student a disciple i anoint you krishna as my teacher as my guru assume the position of the teacher and instruct me with regard to the goal and purpose of life and how i shall attain it am i clear Huh? Yes. Am I clear? Yes. Goal of life: sitting on the chariot in the midst of the Kurukshetra battlefield, where 4.5 million warriors beyond the boundaries of India also had assembled for an 18-day war. Right in the midst of that war field. before the commencement of the war discharge of arrows arjuna stops himself stops the entire course of the war and engages in a dialogue with krishna 
asking him to explain to him what is the goal of life even for me in this dire situation this is why bhagavad gita is popular bhagavad gita is valuable it's a gospel of life for everyone in every situation you may not be a fighter you may not have a war beforehand be right in front but understand that we have a mind and like the mind of arjuna we have an intelligence resembling that of arjuna we have a crisis any time in life it can come but in all these processes what is involved is our personality our mind our intelligence our ego our purpose the world is what we see what we see we are not concerned with the world which we do not see we are concerned with the world which our senses perceive and we are interacting with the world the world does not interact with us only living beings interact with the rest of the world the dead objects do not interact at all the earth does not interact with me i only interact with the earth the air does not interact with me i interact with the air so the interactions are always proceeding from us subsisting on us and terminating and concluding in us so we are the interacting personality in this personality we have the body a subject for medicine and doctors to deal with but the mind is our subject intelligence is our subject ego is our subject we alone can know them feel them experience them and all the crises that you are reporting are crises pertaining to the human mind pertaining to human emotions crises pertaining to the intelligence the rationale that the intelligence is able to produce this is why bhagavad gita has become a universal life gospel to be read to be understood to be applied every day in your life for all life situations this is bhagavad gita and arjuna standing in the midst of war having come there for war stops the war so to say and he enquires and asks for a clarification by what process can i get everlasting goodness and well being for me i cannot think of taking back my weapon and fighting this war unless this clarity this assurance this hope this confidence this purpose this objective is made clear to me krishna he says so tomorrow i will speak more about and straight away enter into bhagavad gita and we will start discussing life what exactly is life let us have a definition and description of life and after knowing what is life what is the place of mind and intelligence i believe the whole subject will be properly revealed and every one of you will be sufficiently enlightened on the one hand reinforced and empowered to deal with your life in any situation that you can think of so tomorrow we shall enter straight into the discussion of life from bhagavad gita is it okay ah huh? shanda swabhava majaratmaka mega satyam sambhit padam nirupamam kalana vihinam antarbahischa bahudha vyavaharyamanam taddaivameva mama sarvam aham tadeva प्रबुद्धं विमुक्त विकारादीन प्रसन्न सदा निबोधस्व परम निश्चल निर्गुण सर्वूपम भजेहम सदा स्मरा प्रणवी हरि ओ हरि ओ ऑल ऑफ यू टुगेदर वन टाइम वी शेल रिसाइट ओंकार हरि ओम तत्स जय गुरु जय